Hello, Keith Rucker here at VintageMachinery.org. Guys, so today we're back to working on the spiral slash helical gear that has been a uh, project in the shop now for way too long. I need to get this thing done and out of here. So in this uh, whole series of videos, we've gone through my journey in getting this machine set up and actually even having to acquire all the parts and pieces necessary uh, to cut this gear. Uh, in the last episode, we actually cut a helical gear for me the very first time using this exact setup. I did it in a piece of plastic, just trying to uh, work through the kinks and everything of the whole setup, the whole system. We successfully completed that first gear. Now we're going to the real thing. So I have mounted up over here in the chuck on the dividing head, the cast iron blank for this uh, Austin timing gear for a, I don't remember the exact year, 20s or 30s, uh, uh, vintage Austin automobile. This is a timing gear that goes on the front. The original one was cracked and broken and they asked me if I could make a new one. So it has been really as much of a challenge for me to figure this thing out as anything else, but I think we are finally ready. So uh, again, if you haven't followed along in the whole series of videos, um, just real quickly, what all is involved in this. We have a universal head set up on my horizontal milling machine where we have our cutter set at the helical angle, which is 45 degrees in this particular gear. I have a dividing head. The dividing head is used to turn that gear, however many increments you need for the number of teeth that you're cutting. This particular gear is a 30 tooth gear. We will use the dividing head. We will actually turn it that number of times and make that many cuts, one for each tooth. This being a helical or spiral gear to make things even more complicated, normally in a spur gear, regular gear, you're just cutting straight across. With this one, because we're cutting at this angle, if I were to just feed straight into this cutter, we would get a nice big scalloped uh, cut all the way across. To get that straight line cut with the cutter turned at 45 degrees, as the table is feeding in, synchronized, it has to rotate that gear for the, what's called the lead. In this case, we've already calculated the lead. And uh, let's see, it is 13.3286 uh, inches. What that means is, is that when this table moves 13.3826 inches, it's going to make one complete revolution of uh, the, the, the work that we've got in here. Um, that is cutting a spiral. And because this is a spiral basically being cut on a cylinder, it is more specifically a helical or a helic, however you want to say it. But uh, you often hear helical gear and, and spiral gear kind of used interchangeably. It is a spiral gear specifically as a helical gear in this case because it's a cylinder. All right, so previously, when we set up to do our previous piece, I've already got this thing centered up on the shaft where it needs to be. What we need to do is come in here and touch off on this gear that will become our zero mark and then we will need to feed the cutter down uh, to actually make the cuts. Now because of uh, the fact that we're cutting in cast iron, I don't want to go the full depth the first pass. So we're going to actually do this in multiple passes. I do the same thing with uh, regular gears that I'm cutting. Uh, I know that my depth of cut is 200 thousandths of an inch. Uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to make the first cut at 100 thousandths and then I'm going to make two additional cuts at 50 thousandths each. As that cut goes deeper, it gets wider, you're making a bigger cut. And uh, just so that we don't put too much stress on everything, I want to uh, take it out in a little bit smaller sections. Now this milling machine would easily cut that full depth in one pass. Uh, my fear though is, is that this gear is up on this uh, shaft down here. Uh, there's normally a key in this gear that will lock it in place, but because this is a timing gear, the keyway needs to be cut timed with the teeth very specifically. It's a lot easier to do that after you cut the teeth than before you cut the teeth. So I don't have a keyway in here. It's just basically friction. This is up on it. This is actually on a tapered shaft and we got a screw tightening it up in there. Should be plenty tight enough but because of the forces involved in this this angle is wanting to rotate this gear. So by making smaller cuts, I minimize the chance of that gear spinning on the shaft 
and messing up the whole project. So anyway, I have done enough talking. If you're more interested in the setup and the details that goes into this pretty complicated setup, this is a whole series of videos. You can go back and watch some of those older videos to learn more. So let's get in here, and start making some chips. All right, well, I think we're about ready to start here. Uh, first thing I wanna do is lower my table down. Uh, I still have it at the full depth for the last cut that we made. It's about 200,000, so I'm just going to lower this down where I should have plenty of clearance there. Uh, I'm going to move my cutter over the work. Now, because of the way we have this whole setup with the lead attachment and the gearing and everything involved in that, it's uh, really not recommended to use the rapid traverse in this system because it's just too much strain on everything because as that table is feeding, it's going through the gear train on the lead attachment, uh, which is gearing everything down and which is actually causing this part to be rotating as it's cutting. So uh, I'm just gonna let the machine feed up on its own uh, till we get it kind of over the cutter. Once we do, we will stop the feed and touch off on the part and kind of get our zero uh, for going. Again, I have previously already set up to have the center of this uh, cut over the center of this. So basically, if you look at wherever the center of the this piece is, it's over the center of this shaft. Um, and we've already got all that set up. And because the that did not change from my test cut that I made previously to now, uh, we're not going to be have to do that again. So we will let this uh, feed on up a little bit more. I want to make sure we're not going to be touching in there. We shouldn't be I'm gonna lower it down just to make sure. All right, we are kind of over the gear now. So I'm stopping my feed. And what I want to do is just raise this up ever so slightly until I just get a chip cut in there. So I'm doing this extremely slow. right there it just barely touched the part so now i'm going to uh, feed back off and basically call that zero let's get some clearance there and then we'll dial in our depth of cut all right i'm powering down my machine here i'm just going to put a dial indicator up here on the head and we will come down and get it set up on this tailstock. And I'm just going to use this to get a really good measurement. I could just read off my dials, but I, I prefer having a gauge that I can read. Now, again, the total depth of cut is going to be 200 thousandths. I'm going to make a 100 thousandths cut in the first pass, and then we'll go back around and make a 50 thousandths depth, uh, depth of cut deeper and then another 50,000, so that'll give us a total of 100,000. So what I'm gonna do is, again, using the dial indicator, we'll just dial up to one inch. I know that when I tighten this table down, it's gonna move about two thou, and I didn't quite get it there. Let me uh, bump it up just a little bit more. And there we go. When I lock the table down, we're reading exactly on 100,000th depth. So uh, we are ready for our first pass. We'll turn on our spindle. I will note that the spindle speed we're using is 75 RPMs. The uh, feed rate of the table is set on two inches per minute. Uh, so let's go ahead and start things up. And as you can see, as soon as I do, the gear is actually rotating and it's going to rotate into that cut at just the right angle to keep that cutter straight across there at that 45 degree angle the entire cut. We're cutting into cast iron. Cast iron really doesn't require a lot of lubrication uh, for cutting so we're probably just going to cut it dry. Uh, cast iron has uh, graphite in it which is actually a pretty decent lubricant in itself. So, uh, all right, now once we get through the cut, 
I'm going to reverse the cut and we're basically just going to back right back up over this. Now, I had some questions previously. Well, isn't that introducing backlash into the system? And theoretically, yes, I'm probably making a little bit of backlash of a cut here. It is extremely minimal, uh, but this is pretty much the accepted way that you do this in this particular case. The only other option would be to lower the table down, back it out, raise the table back up, and you actually have got more chances to inter or introduce uh, variations to the teeth by not getting your depth exactly right than you are just backing it out. And there's actually some allowances built into things uh, to account for that backlash uh, on the, the depth of cut and everything that we're making there. So after we've made our first cut, we need to actually rotate the gear the proper distance to make a 30 tooth gear. And again, we're using the dividing head for that. Uh, this dividing head has got different holes, number of holes in this setup. And uh, we're gonna turn it so far and we'll get the proper increments. I've already looked up in my chart to see what that needs to be. I've already got this set. So basically I just pulled the pin out and I've got this little scepter arm in here to measure that distance. So that is how far we needed to turn it to make 1 30th of a cut. Now we will engage the table and it's going to do it again. Notice that the whole head here is spinning and it's going to pretty much do that exact same range of motion on every cut that we make, but we'll be changing the index with the head on here. And again, notice the lead attachment down here on this end. This is tied into the screw of the table. So as it's moving out, it goes through a gear train to give us our lead that's gonna rotate this on the dividing head to make it all work out. Fortunately, there is a, a book that I have for this dividing head set up that has all that stuff in tables that you can look up. The, uh, the indexing for the head as well as to figure out what gears need to go in here for your lead. It also gives you the mathematical formulas that you can figure it out on your own, uh, but fortunately I was just able to look all that information up. So once we get out of that cut up here again, we will index our head again and make another pass. So let's uh, let it finish that cut up. Make sure that we've got that cutter completely clear on the front side so that as we turn it, we're not turning into the cutter. And we got plenty of clearance there. And again, we will index to our next hole, which is right there. Move my scepter around make our next cut. One thing that I'll mention is that um, we talked about the allowances given for the backlash and also for the fact that this cutter is, is probably cutting a little bit on either the front and back of that helix, helical cut each pass. Uh, to compensate for some of that, we use a different number gear cutter than what we would normally use. And they, they compensate for that by uh, mathematically calculating the theoretical number of teeth in the gear for selecting the gear cutter. With these involute cutters, there are eight different cutters that you choose from, depending on the number of teeth that you're going to be cutting. And uh, as you get wider or, or more or less teeth, basically the width of that cut is going to vary so that you get the right involute shape. Uh, when we do this, even though this is a 30 tooth gear, uh, we calculated that we needed to choose a cutter as if there were 85 teeth in this. And that gives us a little bit of extra allowance that's involved. Uh, to make sure that our clearances come out right and we account for that little bit of backlash that we're going to get on the back cut. I will say, watch my, my handle here when I reverse this. It is virtually instantaneous from once the table starts moving. So there's very, very little backlash involved in all this, but you can hear it touching. It probably would, you would probably hear a little bit of noise just from contact as it goes through there regardless, but it's been taken into account and uh, it's all in the manuals, guys, when you, when you uh, do the write or read up, read up on this and do the homework, which I've done plenty of. 
I got you down here looking into the lead attachment uh, where you can kind of see the gearing. Now, if you look down here on the very bottom, there is a uh, shaft right there that is turning. That is the actually directly fed into the uh, table, the, the screw that's feeding the table across. And uh, you can't see it, but there's a set of worm gears in here. There's two gears uh, that go through there that start the reduction of everything as far as uh, all of the, the, the ratios. You reverse the table. Um, and I can change that out. I got three different sets of worms. They can be positioned in two different positions. So there's six possible combinations with the worm gears. They then come up to a, a set of change gears, and we've got two different uh, ratios that we can change on these. I've got a complete set of change gears, 30-something gears. Uh, when you add it all up, there's something like 13,000 possible uh, leads that this uh, particular setup uh, can cut, just depending on how you get it set up to give you those leads that we need for these different cuts that we make. So again, we're gonna do our index for the gear teeth. And when we engage, you see the shaft coming from the lead attachment to the dividing head. This is what's actually causing it to spin the gear on there. Uh, this shaft is independent of the actual indexing for the teeth. It's all tied in together. Now, I think I remember reading in the manual that the ratio on this drive shaft here is 40 to one. So it has to turn 40 times down here to give you one revolution of the chuck. And uh, this particular, the lead part on this is the same on the Kearney Trekker dividing heads, whether it's a Model K dividing head or a Model H dividing head. Now we have on this machine right now, a Model K dividing head. Uh, the ratio between this handle and the chuck is five to one. So you have to turn this handle five times for every rotation on the Model K. On the Model H dividing heads, which are a little bit smaller, it's a 40 to one ratio again. Um, so you have to turn the handle 40 times to every one time. But because this is the same on both of them, you can theoretically use the same lead attachment for both of them because that's always gonna be 40 to one. But the handle here is gonna depend on whether you have a Model H dividing head or a Model K dividing head. Now with other manufacturers, the dividing heads, those ratios can be different, but uh, 40 to one is one of the more common um, options that are out there that I see on a lot of dividing heads. We've been continuing on uh, cutting teeth uh, just about around here. We got a couple more teeth to cut in there and we will have our first round complete here. So everything appears to be going good so far. My uh, cutting has been pretty much effortless, which is nice. Um, I think what I'm going to do is when we go ahead and do the next cut, rather than doing two fifty thousandths passes, I think I'm just going to feed in the whole hundred thou and uh, do this in two operations. Uh, I hope I don't regret that decision, but as easy as this first pass has been cutting, uh, I, I don't think we'll have any problems. Like I said, this machine is capable of really hogging a lot of material out and cast iron is relatively soft got a good sharp cutter in there so uh, we should be good to go so see I think we'll have one more tooth after this one all right here we go All right, we need to put in our extra 100 thou here. I'm going to go ahead and release the table lock. I'll probably move that needle just a tad. And we'll crank up another 100 thousandths. And lock the table back. And that should be exactly 100 thou. We're ready for our second pass. Let's see if we can get this gear knocked out. All right, round two. 
Let's see how this uh, looks and sounds and feels. I don't think we'll have any problem with it, but uh, let's uh, do a cut here and see how things look and sound. Might be cutting just a little bit harder than that last pass, but it's not by much. I think we're gonna be fine. This will be the full depth of cut, getting that full involute shape in there for the gear. You can see it looks more like a gear now than that first pass, which was not the full depth. All right, and we'll back back out. Do our next division here. And make another pass. Alright guys, this is the last tooth. If all is done right, that should line up perfectly. And we should be done with this job, so uh we'll take it off, do a little inspection, but I as far as I can tell, it looks great. Uh, we'll do a little bit more inspecting once we get it off of the off the machine, but uh, yeah, one spiral gear. All right, let's back her out. Guys, I have taken this off. I went over and we did some deburring to it, um, just using a, like a scotch Bright type wheel just to make sure we didn't have any sharp corners or edges on there. And uh, I'm happy with the results. I did a, some, some quick measurements, just measuring the thickness of this gear versus this one and the depth and all that. And it all matches up just near about perfect. So uh, I feel confident that we've got a good gear here. Uh, this is the original. Of course, it was broken. And uh, I don't know if we have two mating gears that come in this way. If so, the helical angle would be the opposite. But these will mount at 45 degrees or excuse me 90 degrees and you know that feels like a nice fit everything feels like it's lining up like it should so uh, I'm real happy again with uh, how this has worked out but we're not quite done yet uh, we got just a little bit more that needs to be done the next step here is I need to you see the original one had a key uh, in the hub this is a tapered hole. I made a tapered brooch bushing in a previous video. I did that while I was making some other stuff and uh, we need to go broach that hole. But it's very important that this be lined up with a tooth exactly right. If you notice, there's a timing mark stamped in here and a letter S in one of those teeth and that's gonna be in alignment with, uh, with the, the, the 
the key that we cut and I need to do a little bit of measuring, a little bit of figuring out exactly where this keyway needs to be presented in this uh, so that the timing marks will line up. So it looks like there's an S there and there's another mark on that one. I can't tell what it is, but we'll, we will, we will get all that to line up like it needs to. And uh, then we'll go broach it. And when that's done, I think we are done. This is the camshaft that it mounts to up here. So I've got my gears oriented in the right way. I, when I had this one cast, I put the same letters in here, Q2 and IA265. And if you look at where the key's pointed, I'm looking at the Q2. I'm gonna call this uh, tooth right here, right at the top. And I'm gonna call this tooth right here, right at the top. May not be exactly, but it's gonna be close enough. And the key is pointed toward the center of this tooth. If you look at where that one lines up and where that one lines up, it looks like this one is pointed straight toward the center of that tooth. And that is one, two, three, four, over from here. So one, two, three, four. We basically want to get this brooch bushing lined up directly toward the center of that tooth. All right, I feel good with that. So we are going to broach that key in that position right there. And then once we're done, we'll come back and we'll actually stamp the timing marks on there, just like the original. Now the key we need to put in this is a 5 30 seconds key. I have a 5 30 seconds brooch that is made for this bushing. And I am going to I typically like to make sure my brooches are well lubed up, if for nothing else, just because of all the pressure and stuff going through this brooch bushing. So we will lube it up real nice. And we will just push that through, and it is going to cut that slot one tooth at a time. This is a two pass brooch, so once we go through the first time, we're going to come back and uh, put a little shim behind the back of it and make another pass. So that was the first pass. This is our shim. And we'll make another pass through here. That should do it. So I got my timing marks in here just like the original. So hopefully that'll be good enough for them. And we're gonna call this project done. So uh, this fits up onto the gear like such. And there you go. I'll get that packed up and headed back to them. Finally, well, there it is. Finally, after all this time, I think we got this gear and I think it's going to work just fine. So, uh, like I said, we'll get it packed up and headed back to them. This has been an incredible project for me. Uh, this one has stretched my um, capabilities and knowledge. I mean, it's not something that I felt was out of realm of me doing in my shop, but it was something that I had never done before. And anytime you do something that's kind of pushing your limits, it's always a learning experience. And this has definitely been a learning experience for me. And uh, it's also been a challenge because I've had to acquire so many parts and pieces and accessories for my lathe. Like I think I mentioned before, I mean, we're using the... Uh, high speed universal head. This is an accessory for this mill machine. It does not come with it normally. We got the Model K dividing head. This is an accessory for this machine. And we have the low lead attachment that attaches to the dividing head. Again, another accessory. Just finding all these bits and pieces and putting everything together so that we could even do this project was a challenge in itself. And then once I got everything assembled, actually learning the process 
and doing things was also a challenge. Fortunately, I've got some good books that, have, uh, that I've been able to look back to. You guys know I kind of collect old uh, books from back in the day, and I found those to be extremely helpful to me. And uh, I've also kind of leaned on a couple of people. I've asked a few people. There's a couple of guys out there who have done these kinds of work before, and I've been picking their brains and asking them questions. They've been helping me out with that as well. But check, we got this off the list now. And um, I can promise you that the next time that we have to do a helical gear, it's going to go much smoother and much easier because I've been through the process. I kind of know what to do. And uh, I've, also, I've also got everything I need. Uh, I was literally scrambling toward the end there to, to get a few little bits and pieces that I didn't think I was going to need but had to have to get this job done. So uh, anyway, we got it done. So with that, guys, that is going to be a wrap. As always, thank you so much for watching. Please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thumbs up and comments greatly appreciate it. It helps out a lot with the analytics on YouTube. A uh, big, huge thank you out there to all my supporters who support the site financially. Literally could not do these projects without us. I mean, I had to go out here and purchase bits and pieces for this lathe and or this mill rather and um, you know if it wasn't for some of you guys help i probably couldn't justify spending the money on this when i look at how much it costs me to make this gear i could never charge that much money but the next time i won't have all the outlay of money to buy all the stuff that goes along with it so the next one will be a lot cheaper but for me it's more about the challenge guys with that we're going to sign off we'll catch you on the next video again thanks for watching